I'm Greg Laughlin, and I am a uh, professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, just, just sort of on the other side of the bay. And it looks on a map like it's a very small distance, but I discovered, much to my chagrin driving up here this morning, that it's actually a fairly large distance when the, when, the, when the traffic is slow. So I kind of arrived just before the conference, and then I realized that I had a couple of uh, computer difficulties. So this is very much going to be a balancing act in an open source world. So I'm going to have to kind of finesse my talk a little bit to get around a lack of certain slides that I was going to show. Um, you know, I always like taking an airplane flight because, and especially if, if, if the plane flies over where I live. Sometimes if you come up from Los Angeles, the plane going into San Jose goes right over the Monterey Bay, and it's, it's really beautiful. You can see the curve of the bay, and you can see the redwood forests, and you know, if you know where to look, you, I, I can see where I live. And in that moment, um, the sort of the world that you're intimately familiar with, you know, where you get coffee in the morning and drive up to work, and where, you know, the sort of the small dramas of your life unfold, you can see how that patch of the surface that is your micro world fits into the surface of the Earth as a whole. And when the, when the plane is flying high at, at, at 35,000 feet, you can just barely get a sense of the fact that the Earth is actually a sphere. You can just get the sense of the curvature of the Earth on the horizon. It's a very, very beautiful sight. And um, that's the one moment when you can sort of connect the scales that astronomers deal with all the time with the scales that sort of inform your, your, your everyday life. And you know, flying to Europe, you, know, you fly for hours and hours, and you get sort of a sense of how large the Earth is. The Earth is really, in my opinion, sort of too large to really, really get your mind around. But if you imagine doing that and taking the entire Earth and shrinking the Earth down to the size of a grain of sand, then you can start to make analogies that are relevant to the astronomical world. So taking the Earth and, and shrinking it down to the size of a grain of sand, and I actually brought a sand grain in my pocket uh, to, to sort of make a, a clearer analogy. Doing that is a demagnification of something like a factor of 100 billion. If you shrink the Earth down by a factor of 100 billion, then it becomes the size of a grain of sand. And what you can do is you can shrink the entire solar system down with the Earth. And so if you do that, then it turns out that the sun is about the size of a, of a penny. Um, so, so a scale model, like a scale model railroad of the solar system, has the Earth as, as a grain of sand shrunk down by a factor of 100 billion, and the sun uh, as the size of a penny shrunk down by a, a factor of, of, of 100 billion. And the distance between the Earth and the Sun at that scale is about the distance of my two arm lengths. So the Sun is right here in my right hand shining, and the Earth is this grain of sand in my left hand. And you can then make a kind of a, an animation of the solar system to show what's going on. And it's, it's a really boring animation, because over the course of one week, the grain of the sand moves around the sun by about that much, by about 1 52nd of the distance. There's 52 weeks in a year. And so in one week, the grain of sand goes 1 52nd of the way around the sun. And of course, if I stand here and make this, this analogy exact, then when you come back next year, um, the Earth will have gone once around the, 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 the sun and, and a year will be complete. And so that, 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 anima that you know, sort of analogy shows a couple of things. One is it shows that the inner solar system is mostly empty space, right? The, the, I've got the whole distance between the sand grain and, 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 the, and the penny. This whole three-dimensional space is just, is just empty stuff. And um, it also shows that you know, if you're worried about you know, getting someplace on time or like, all these emails that are piling up in your inbox, all that kind of stuff, it really helps to remember that it's just uh, like a, a sand grain going around a penny once a year. Um, 
And not only that, but it's, it's like the thinnest film on the surface of a sand grain going around a penny once. Most of the Earth is just solid rock and iron. So um, astronomy can sometimes calm you down if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel <laughs> stressed, stre stressed out. So that's, that's one of the benefits. And the Earth and the Sun are just uh, you know, sort of two members of our solar system. Um, we have eight planets, used to be nine, now we have eight planets in, in our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are all small uh, objects which, which, which um, Mercury and Venus are inside the sun's orbit. Mars is just outside. They're smaller than the Earth. Mars is 10 times smaller than the Earth. Uh, Mercury is, is 20 times smaller than the Earth. And then the larger planets in our solar system, uh, starting with Jupiter, Jupiter is five times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. So if I get that sun back out, put the Earth out at the right distance, um, if we want to make a scale model of Jupiter, we could take a very small peppercorn and place it five times further um, from the sun than the Earth is. So that would place it right about at the wall. Um, Pluto, uh, the sort of one of the outermost objects in the solar system is 40 times farther from the Earth than the sun is. And so at that scale, this is sort of out, out, out in the yard outside of, of um, this, this, this conference center. And so you really see you know, there's the, the solar system is, is very sparse and very empty place. But if we want to get a sense of the distances between the stars, then even this highly demagnified scale isn't, isn't enough. What I need to do to really give you a sense of the distance of stars is to take the sun, which I've already taken the liberty of shrinking down by a factor of 100 billion to the size of a penny. I need to take the sun and shrink that down by another factor of 100. I need to make this penny 100 times smaller. If I make a penny 100 times smaller, then it too is the size of a grain of sand. So what have I done? I've brought the sun, this enormous fusing orb of hydrogen and helium gas, down to the size of a grain of sand. And so at that scale, then the distances between the stars, the stars that you see when you look up at the night sky, start to become tractable. If the sun is a grain of sand, then Alpha Centauri, the nearest solar system, are three more grains of sand six miles away. Right? So it's an incredible, incredible distance relative to the sizes of these objects. So sun is the size of a sand grain, the nearest stars are six miles away. Um, if I wanted to make a model of the galaxy that we live in, I would need to take 100 billion stars. So 100 billion sounds like a lot. 100 billion dollars is a lot of money. 100 billion of anything sounds like a lot. It turns out that 100 billion sand grains doesn't really occupy that much volume. If I had 100 billion sand grains, they would they would about fill up this box right here. Um, I could, 100 billion sand grains would about fill, fill the this, this size of this lectern. If I wanted to make a model of the galaxy, I would need to take this big box full of sand, 100 billion sand grains, and then spread them out over a distance that's roughly 2,000 times the size of the continental United States. Each star is separated from the other stars by a couple of miles and they make this enormous expanse. It would stretch from here to the moon, 2,000 times the size of the continental of the United States. There's, there's just, it's mostly all just empty space. The first approximation, the second approximation, um, what's out there is just, is just empty space. And so um, I've been interested for, for hundreds of years, um, people have wondered, are there, are there other planets out there? Are, are, there other, are there other Earths? And that question, answering that question, has really been stymied by these vast, vast distances, right? If you're, you know, sort of a sand grain, you're near a sand grain, and there's another sand grain six miles away, and you need to detect a small virus in the vicinity of that sand grain, it's extremely difficult. Not only that, but stars are very bright, so trying to see a planet orbiting a distant star is, I like these analogies, and a great analogy is to take a, a firefly and put it next to an extremely bright searchlight, right next to an extremely bright searchlight, and then put that searchlight all the way out at the distance of the moon and try to see the firefly. It would just be 
it'd be effectively, it's very, very, very difficult. It's not impossible. We're starting to detect planets orbiting other stars, but it's been a long process. It's, it's been a, a tough road, and we're just starting to get success. Um, so the way that we actually do it, the way that we find planets orbiting other stars is not by looking through the telescope and seeing them directly. A few planets have been seen like that, very, very young planets that are still very hot and can kind of compete a little bit with their parent star have been found by looking through telescopes. But most of the time what we have to do is um, if we have a planet orbiting a star, and what I'll do is, is I'll pretend that this is the star and this is the planet, what they do is they both actually go around their point of balance. So um, if you imagine if the planet and the star were the same size, like these two pennies, then the point of balance would be exactly between them. And so they would both fall endlessly around that point of balance. But because the star is much more massive than the planet, the sun is about 300,000 times heavier than the Earth, um, that means that the sun makes a very small circle, and the Earth makes a very large circle. So as the Earth goes around the sun, the sun isn't fixed, but the sun goes back and forth in response to the Earth. It's a bit like if, if, you, if, I, if I took a sort of a long rod and attached two spheres to it, one very, very heavy sphere and one light one, then sort of doing these demonstrations without any actual equipment. I've got a sphere here in this hand, I've got a lighter one here, and there's a connecting rod between them. You can imagine that, okay, I can take my finger and put it right there at the point of balance between the heavy sphere and the light sphere, right? So if I do that carefully, right at, uh, right at the point of balance, then you can see that the heavy sphere, which is close to the point of balance, is just balanced, kind of like a teeter-totter that's just right with the light planet that's over there. And I can kind of take that thing, like, kind of like a Harlem Globetrotter, lift it up, right? It's just sitting there. There's the heavy star, and there's the light planet. And I can give the heavy star a push. So now it's like, whoa. Right? The star is moving around the point of balance, and then the planet is going in a larger circle around the point of balance. So the point here is that as the planet goes around the star, the star makes a circular path. And as it makes that circular path, Every single person in the audience, no matter where you're sitting, is seeing my right hand get closer to them and then further away from them. Right? My hand is going around in a circle, but from wherever your viewpoint is, you're seeing it approaching and then receding and approaching and receding. And it turns out that that approach and recession, turns out that that can be very, very accurately measured. So the way that we find planets is by measuring how the star goes back and forth. OK, so I know this isn't a science conference. right? I know that this is a conference about the, you know, the synthesis of the aesthetic viewpoint with sort of many different aspects of the modern world. And so the last thing I want to do is to veer into some technical science talk about how we discover extrasolar planets. And I'm on kind of danger of doing that right now. So how much time has elapsed? How much, how much, this is kind of about time, right? Where, where are we at in terms of time? Sorry? Okay, okay. Okay, we've got at least 10 minutes. So what I'm gonna do is, <clears throat> I have this software that sort of shows how um, this all works. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot, lot of detail here. Um, but w what happens is that whenever I have a star going back and forth, then if I have a planet which is in orbit around it, so let me, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to make one planet in an orbit around a star. So right here, that's what I have to, whoa. <laughs> That would be pretty embarrassing if I fell off the stage during my talk. Um, here's, here's, here's the stars in the center here, and the planet is, is going around like this. Now, planets can have all sorts of different properties. Um, 
they can have uh, orbits that are closer to the star or farther from the star. Let me try to break this out here to a larger, a larger size so you can see it more easily. I'm going to take this planet, and I'm just going to change its, its, its properties, right? So if I make the planet's orbital period longer or shorter, it's a little hard to work because I don't have quite as many pixels as I normally do. If I make the, the planet's period shorter, it gets closer to the star. If I make the planet's period longer, it gets further from the star. And I can control um, where the planet starts in, in its orbit. Right? So you can see how the planet is, is either, you know, I can start it down there at 5 o'clock, or I can start it up here near 12 o'clock. You see it moving there in its orbit? And then I can also not change its orbit, but I can change its size. Right now, the planet that I've pulled up there is 300 times more massive than the Earth. But what I can do is I can make its mass lower. That doesn't change the orbit, but what it does do is it changes the uh, amount by which the sun responds, right? So I was talking about how the sun goes around the point of balance. And the more massive the planet is, the larger the circle that the sun makes. And the smaller the planet is, the smaller the circle that the sun makes. And so what this is doing is this is showing the back and forth motion of the sun as the planet goes around it. And so if I make the orbital period longer, then that back and forth motion gets stretched out. If I make the period shorter, that back and forth motion gets sped up. Um, I can change where the planet is in its orbit. So if I just make the period, the orbital time longer, I can change where the planet is in its orbit. That moves that curve sort of back and forth. You see how the, that curve is, is moving back and forth. And then I can also do a couple of other interesting things to the orbit. Um, I can change its shape. Orbits are actually ellipses. And so um, I can move the, 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 the orbit so it becomes more stretched out. See now how the orbit is becoming more and more eccentric, sort of like a comet there. And when the orbit is like a comet, it spends a long time out here and it goes, whoo, falls in through the star very quickly at one point of its orbit and is moving very slowly. And so that causes the star to respond in a kind of an odd way. And then a planetary system doesn't just have to have uh, one planet in it. It can have more than one planet. And so here's the effect of taking two planets. And let's change this crazy shape of the inner planet. Um, I have two planets here, and that's giving me a very strange up and down curve for the star. If I have two planets going around a star, the star is going, whoa, 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 it doesn't, doesn't quite know how to follow an orderly trajectory. And so a lot of my work, a lot of my everyday work goes into measuring the back and forth motions of various stars and seeing these kinds of waveforms and then trying to understand what's going on, what kinds of planets would create the waveform. I can't see the planets. All I can see is the back and forth motion of the star as the planets go around the star. And it occurred to me that this looks like a sound wave, right? This isn't a sound wave, right? It's the back and forth motion, the back and forth wave that the star makes as planets go around it. But it goes on forever and it has a complicated shape, and it has a basic periodicity. This is very similar to a musical note. If I pluck a string on the guitar, then it has fundamental frequency. But the waveform also has all sorts of up and down. And that's what gives the sound its richness. That's what gives the sound its timbre. And so I became kind of interested in, like, what do these planetary systems sound like? Right? No one had ever heard these sounds before. Um, in fact, the, the, the star doesn't make a sound in an absolute sense. But if you were able to somehow speed that motion up and play it through a speaker, what would it sound like? Um, so I can, show, I can show a few examples. But before I do that, it helps to sort of try to imagine, like, what is the sound 
of the solar system. So it's just like, in your, in your mind, try to think, like, what, what, what does it sound like? Is it some kind of celestial harmony, or is it just like a, a boring dial tone on a phone or a busy signal? What, what does it sound like? Um, Jimi Hendrix, Purple Haze. Hey Joe was my favorite Jimi Hendrix song, actually. Um, so what I'll do is I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just open up file that shows what the inner solar system um, sounds like. So the, the here we go, right here. OK, so not quite sure what the volume is going to be. So let's turn down the volume to start out with so we don't get blasted. OK, now this is going to be, this is going to be the sound of the, the inner solar system. So I'm not including Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. I'm just including the Earth, Venus, Mercury, and Mars. OK, so I've started playing it, so let's. So, you know, I asked you to imagine you probably had like, oh man, this is going to sound incredibly cool. And then, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and like I could, I could like kind of do an emperor's new clothes thing and try to fool people into sound, thinking that that sounded cool, right? And it, um, no, but it, it sounds really boring. L listen to this. It sounds really boring. Um, <laughs> It's not something you would want to just endlessly listen to. But that turns out is a very good thing. It's, it's actually a very good thing that the sound that our inner solar system makes in this sense is boring because that means that the Earth is going around on a stable orbit. The sound isn't varying. If the sound were varying, then that would mean that the Earth's orbit would be changing wildly. And that would not be a good thing for us, right? It's not a good thing for us if all of a sudden we're going around the sun in orbit the last a few days, and then we're getting shot out into long eccentric trajectories. Those are the kinds of things that are required to make interesting sounds. And when we look out at the other solar systems that we can see, we can see that there are actually some much more interesting sounds than what the solar system makes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with um, some systems that are in good shape. Right, I'm going to start with some systems where the orbits have actual harmonic relationships to each other that are similar to the harmonic relationships within chords. Okay, so what we say in, in astronomy is that these, these planets are in resonance. And from a musical standpoint, that resonance is, is exact. So there's both sort of a, a analogy in terms of signal processing, but there's also an analogy in terms of, of harmony. So these are some sounds of some solar systems who have um, resonant waveforms. And they, they, they sound a lot better. So let's, let's try this one first. So that's a, that's a much richer tone. It's, it's sort of like, it's like sort of an organ-like sound. Here's, here's another example. Um, this is a system of several planets that, that have harmonic relationships that make up a chord. If you listen to that again, you can hear there's sort of a vibrato on top of it. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Those are the orbits actually vibrating slightly over thousands of years. If you're just watching the planets go around the star, you get no sense of this. This is something that unfolds over a very long period of time. This is a bit like making one of those sped up movies of a storm going through. You see the thunderheads billowing and boiling. You see all the action. Whereas if you're just looking at it, it just looks like clouds. Let's play that resonance system one more time. It's a very, very, very cool sound. But then there are also uh, planetary systems that are not doing very well. Um, and in fact, over thousands of years, the planets can interact, the planets can collide, the planets can eject each other, the planets can crash into the sun. And so it's interesting to hear what the sounds are like when that happens. And the palette of sounds that occurs there 
uh, really can start to get interesting. So this is another thing where it's, it's, it's good to like, what would it sound like if a solar system starts to go stable? Planetary orbits start to cross, planets start to have close encounters, planets start to get tossed out of a system. What would, what would the waveform of the star that is in that system, if turned into a sound wave, what would that sound like? It helps to sort of try to imagine that. Here's an example of an unstable solar system. It's, it's just a bizarre sound, right? So this is, this is a crazy orbital evolution. If you listen to this sound, it starts out, there's nice harmonic tones, but it's not quite in resonance. It's a bit like a wheel on a car. If you just like take the lug nuts and just loosen them up a little bit and start driving quickly, things will be all right for a while, but then they get rapidly out of control. That's what happens to this solar system. Here's, each, each time is completely different. It's a very chaotic. Here's, here's another example of, of, of an unstable waveform. So what's going on there is a, a planet is actually being ejected. It's being thrown into a larger and larger orbit and finally leaving the system altogether. So now I know I've run over my 20 minutes um, by quite a bit. So I, I will, will, will stop there, and you know we can we can talk more about this as as, as we go on. So thanks.